what is up Stockholm and my name is Simland and I'm super glad to be here and I'm from Estonia and it's especially you know glad to see that you know biohacking is becoming more popular in the Nordic region as well we we also had our first biohacking conference in Riga but the first one in politics so I was I was speaking there as well so Stockholm is another great opportunity to you know spread what I'm researching and what I'm uh, most involved with so what the topic of my speech is going to be about achieving anti-fragility and metabolic flexibility with the ketogenic diet. And I'm, I'm sure like a lot of people have heard about what is keto, what is ketosis, but uh, you, you may not have heard about, you know, anti-fragility and uh, metabolic flexibility in particular. So I'm going to be talking about this. Basically, the main idea or the main anxiety or the problem of my speech is that I feel like as a, as a society, I see a lot of people who are suffering from, you know, chronic fatigue, obesity, diabetes, different kinds of neurodegenerative diseases. And they are, they're all kind of tied to, they're not something that are supposed to be a part of our human nature and human biology. They're deviant in nature. And uh, there's something sim simply a mismatches in our environment and with the food that we eat in particular. So that's what I would call like a fragile metabolism that is susceptible or, or suspect to these different kinds of... Uh, misconceptions and different kinds of um, shortcomings of from our modern environment and you know people are definitely i feel like almost everyone can you know attest to this that they they have experienced this sort sort short periods of brain fog where they're not feeling optimal where they're feeling that the food that they eat isn't giving them that the results that they're afterwards so my the, the purpose of my speech is to kind of solve this problem and uh, the, the concept of anti-fragility comes from the author and philosophist and economical researcher Nassim Nicholas Taleb. He has written a, an amazing book called Anti-Fragile Things That Gain From Disorder. And what the basic idea is that something that is anti-fragile isn't, it, it's the opposite to something that is fragile. When, when a fragile thing breaks under pressure, then an anti-fragile thing is something that actually gains from it. It gains from chaos, from stress and volatility, and it becomes better. So it's, it's not the same as something that is resilient. Something that is resilient simply resists the shock and stays the same, but anti-fragile, it gets better. So th this, this is the diagram he uses to describe it. As you can see, a fragile thing simply breaks like a piece of glass. You drop it, it's, it's going to break. Then there's something that is resilient or robust. It kind of you know, stays the same. It doesn't, it doesn't feel any different either. But anti-fragile is something that, you know, it's going to get better and evolve further because of that, because of this sort of uh, damage to its system and, and stress. So how do you achieve this sort of uh, anti-fragile metabolism in terms of nutrition? You basically, we're going to start from some of the basics, which is, your, your human body can run on different fuel sources. The most common one, the one that is you, you use by default, is glucose, which comes from carbohydrates, sugars, and uh, basically, if you if you ever, if you eat something that has you know carbohydrates or sugars in them, like a piece of fruit, bread, or some candy, within the 24 hours, then you're basically running on this glucose burning engine, and which is also referred to as like the sugar burning mode. Then there are these different things called fatty acids and ketone bodies. Uh, fatty acids are definitely, you know, stuff that's around your waistline and uh, stuff like MCT oil, coconut oil, butter, bacon, cheeses, those kinds of things. They're, they're comprised of some fats and proteins. And those fatty acids from those can be used as energy. But ketone bodies are actually the byproducts of fatty acid metabolism. They're like a fourth macronutrient. Uh, besides carbohydrates, proteins, and fats, they're like separately, and they have like a unique metabolic effect on your body, and they can be used as a fuel source. And uh, in the presence or in the lack of presence of glucose, when your body doesn't have access to glycogen and glucose, then you begin to start using those ketone bodies as an alternative fuel source that your brain can begin to use. So, yeah, and those ketone bodies can come either from your own body fat, while you're fasting, for instance, where consuming no food at all, then you're literally converting your own body fat into energy and producing ketones. Or those ketones can also come from, you know, exogenous dietary sources like eating. And this is called the fat burning mode. And uh, you'd probably have heard of the keto diet as well. It's become very popular over the past few days, past few years. As you can see, like this sort of a Google trend is also shows that exponential growth in uh, the, the search of 
ketogenic dieting because, you know, there's a lot of ideas about, yeah, you can burn a ton of fat, get ripped and uh, eat bacon and butter at the same time. So all of those are true, by the way, but uh, yeah, there are some different nuances. And uh, the keto diet isn't some sort of a fad either. It may seem like it's a very relative new thing, but in, it's actually been used ever since the 1920s to cure, cure children who have epilepsy and different neurological conditions because of the magnificent ability of the ketones to substitute the glucose during uh, states of uh, energy deprivation. So there are many other health benefits, reduced inflammation, fat burning, mental clarity, anti-aging, better skin, mitochondrial biogenesis, which is one of the main reasons of chronic disease and chronic fatigue, is that your mitochondria, the powerhouse of your cells, they're gonna they're not able to produce enough energy or they're doing it very inefficiently. So when you are keto adapted, then you improve your mitochondria's ability to burn more energy in a more efficient manner and yeah, risk of many chronic diseases as well. So one of the reasons why the ketogenic diet is the foundation to like an anti-fragile nutrition strategy is that when you compare like the fat burning mode and the sugar burning mode, then you can see that First of all, your body's ability to store glycogen and carbohydrates is very limited. Your body can only store, store about 2,000 calories of glucose in your body in the, in the form of liver glycogen, muscle glycogen, and uh, it gets depleted quite quickly. And whenever that stores, they get, when they run out, then you kind of experience at least a, a mild energy crisis in a sense. You do notice that you get hungry, you get brain fog in a sense, you want something sweet to kind of pick yourself up. And that's also one of the reasons why people go, go for and out. the extra cup of coffee, put some sugar in it as well during the noon time and to kind of to make, make sure that they're going to make it to the, until the evening. But if you compare it that to a fat burning mode, then you can see that your body fat has, you know, almost unlimited amounts of energy you can store. Even people who have 10% and less body fat, they can store about, you know, 40,000 calories in their body all the time. And that's fuel. You know, the problem isn't that there's lack of energy. The problem is more like you're not able to access the energy because, you know, there are a lot of people carry extra body fat and it's, it's needed for survival. But uh, we simply don't tap into it because of our modern diet, namely because of our eating, you know, too many carbohydrates because and we're eating too frequently as well. It's going to inhibit our ability to enter into this ketosis state. So that's why I believe like the foundation to anti-fragility is the ketogenic state because you can always go upward. You can always level up in a sense that if you are keto adapted, if you eat some carbs, you can gain the benefit. But if you were to be only in the sugar burning mode all the time and you, you, know, you, you experience this mo moment where you're not getting access to food, then you're going to experience the drop. So that's where like the anti-fragility and fragility comes into play. You can always level up with the ketogenic diet if you consume some sugars, but you can't level up with the sugar burning mode if you eat some, if you fast or if you eat some fat. And there are also like different unique metabolic benefits of the, of the keto, ketogenic diet, especially after becoming keto adapted many, for many months. And this is one, one study done, one of the pioneering uh, researchers Finney and uh, Jeff Wallach, and they have shown that these elite level endurance athletes, after six months of keto adaptation, uh, during prolonged periods of exercise, they, they go, they're, they're burning a lot more fat, fatty acids during exercise. And uh, what it means is that their body can produce or their body can run on fatty acids and ketones at higher intensities as well. Usually your body uses glycogen at something along the lines of very intense exercise, like lifting weights, sprinting, burpees, jumping up and down, that's the, that's the moment when your body is using key, key, like this glycogen for fuel. And when you're moving around, walking, doing some jogging and stuff like that, then you're burning ketones. But after keto adaptation, you kind of raise the ceiling at which you can use fatty acids as well. You can use like fatty acids and ketones at higher intensities of exercise, even like sprinting and weightlifting. So your body becomes more efficient at uh, using the fuel it has. And uh, when I'm talking about ketosis, then what I mean, the, there's a dif distinctive dis dis difference between like the nutritional state of ketosis and keto adaptation. The state of ketosis is basically, you can register that with taking some blood ke ke ketone measurements. And usually it starts when your blood ketones are above 0 
and uh, anything above, all the way up to you know 10 and, uh, and, and things like that, usually you're not able to reach that high levels of ketoacidosis, which are dangerous with a normal keto diet. Usually it happens with diabetics and you know, alcohol poisoning and stuff like that. But let's say, the, well, let's say someone who has eaten something uh, within, with, that has carbs within the 24 hours or something, they're usually like 0 0.1 of nutritional ketosis, and uh, that's the amount of ketones that they have in their body. So it's quite low, and they're not burning any fat almost at all, or at least like their mitochondria. And keto adaptation is, this, is the kind of a state of your body has become adapted to using those ketones. And uh, when you, you can see the sugar burning mode is quite limited in terms of you only have 2000 calories of, uh, of, uh, endogenous, of endogenous fuel. And after you become keto adapted, you kind of get access to this massive ability to burn your own body fat and to kind of literally transform it into energy. And this kind of kind of a <laughs> lightning bolt from the UFOs, it represents this sort of a period of adaptation where it's quite difficult because people experience a keto flu. It's a, yeah, an energy crisis. Your body is swapping in between those fuel sources and it's, uh, yeah, it still requires some uh, time to go through this period. And um, although the ketogenic diet is very healthy, it's very, you know, uh, sustainable and uh, health and, you know, has many benefits. The problem is that it's still like a strict ketogenic diet is still fragile in a sense, because you're still limited to the, the uh, you're still limited by the foods that you eat, that you have to maintain this strict ketogenic state and you have to eat those foods. And of course, if you come off the keto diet, then also going to experience another energy crisis of going back to carbs. So that's another fragile, you know, that's not good either. You don't want that. So the purpose isn't to maintain strict ketosis or to eat the strict ketogenic diet. The purpose is to main, achieve metabolic flexibility. So the, usually the keto diet macros are also very limited. You know, a lot of the conventional foods are eliminated, you know, bread, potatoes, sugars, milks, and you have to be quite strict with the macronutrients you eat as well. And it's not very sustainable in the sense. So the purpose isn't to be strict keto all the time. And uh, to kind of achieve this metabolic flexibility to reach like anti-fragility with the keto diet is to use these different types of uh, car wash strategies, basically. And, uh, you know, the standard keto diet is very, you know, like low carb, high fat, moderate protein. Then there's the targeted keto diet, which basically means that you're consuming uh, slightly more carbohydrates do around your workouts when you're, you know, burning glycogen and those carbs you do consume, they're going to be used more efficiently during that exercise and you're going to burn them off. And after the exercise, you're going to go back into ketosis. And then there's the cyclical keto diet, which basically means that you eat keto for a week and then you have like a day where you're eating like a ton of carbs, you know, like <laughs> I've done it myself in the past and you, yeah, you can basically eat like 1000 grams of carbs which like is half a cake or something like that, then you can still be in ketosis by the next day because you're so kind of keto adapted. And uh, there are like a lot of confusions about it as well. Like, oh, I don't know how to structure it. How many carbs should I eat? And uh, it, it may cause a lot of confusions. So there is the, like, the timing aspect of it is very important as well because if you do eat the carbs at the wrong time, then you're going to get kicked out of ketosis and you're going to lose your keto adaptation as well. So the key is to eat keto the majority of time and use those carb up strategies in very specific conditions where your body is going to utilize those carbohydrates very fast and you're going to get back into ketosis. So there is indeed some, some of the bodybuilding myths about, you know, there's a short time frame after exercise where you can get away with, you know, eating some foods that are going to promote muscle growth. So there is some truth to that definitely. And it definitely applies to the ketogenic diet and this anti-fragility. And uh, what I tend to call it is like this three stages of the keto diet, which basically means that first, you have to become keto adapted in a sense that you have to follow a strict keto diet at first to, be, you know, to achieve this sort of a metabolic flexibility state. Then the second stage is becoming keto adapted where you kind of implement different kinds of exercise, high intensity and both anaerobic and aerobic exercise to teach your mitochondria to produce energy at different intensities as well. And uh, the last stage is this metabolic flexibility stage where you're using these different carb strategies to not lose your ability to convert carbohydrates into energy as well and to not experience any keto flu or carb flu or anything like that. So that's the first part of my speech. The second part of my speech is also going to talk about these different allergens 
that also people suffer from. You know, a lot of people suffer from autoimmune diseases. They can't tolerate gluten or they're vegan or they're paleo or stuff like that. Those are all, those are all like fragile, fragile, fragile strategies that are preventing you from achieving your true potential in terms of metabolism. And uh, it also coincides with one of the myths or legends about Mithridates, the sixth of Pontus. And he was this king who uh, he, he used different kinds of poisons to take and uh, to kind of develop this resiliency and resistance towards those poisons as to not, be, as to not die from them. He was afraid that uh, he's going to die because, you know, he was the king and there were definitely some assassins who were one of him dead. But uh, he, he was kind of a skeptic and he was constantly microdosing, maybe like with lithium almost <laughs> and, uh, and the different kinds of stuff. But the problem was that also that when he was captured by the Romans, uh, he, he tried to kill himself, but he couldn't because he had developed like resistance towards the poison. So <laughs> Sergio, you can take some notes, maybe like uh, whenever you do fall into Romans, then you may have to work around something. And uh, yeah, definitely that's one of another reasons why I think it's important to kind of develop not only anti-fragility towards carbohydrates or glucose, but also anti-fragility towards these different uh, allergens, gluten, uh, legumes, nightshade. You don't want to become so resistant towards them that you're going to get an autoimmune disease in immediately. Like people who do a strict vegan diet or a strict paleo diet, they may develop like, uh, they, they, they're going to get a serious autoimmune condition after they accidentally eat some bread or something. That's a huge, huge mistake. You know, you, we live in an environment where we're getting ex exposed to these kinds of things very frequently and you don't want to become this sort of a very weak metabol metabolizer of those nutrients. And metabolic flexibility is also like, yeah, it, it kind of shows that you're able to produce energies at different... Uh, you, whenever you do oxidize carbohydrates, you're able to, you know, go back into the fat burning mode very fast and you're not going to experience any energy crisis. So that's the main idea. And uh, the bi bi biological phenomenon is hormesis, like a sweet spot of a lethal toxin that actually makes you better and stronger. And uh, definitely it starts with taking care of your gut, exposing yourself to different kinds of allergens. Not, not all the time, but let's say 95% of the time you want to stay strict and you know, 5% you're going to implement very strategically and very different conditions. And some foods that also promote this hormesis, we, you know, I think all, all, all of us know it. Green tea has many anti-aging benefits, antioxidants. And then there are these uh, dark pigment fruits and uh, reservatrol red wine even has like very small doses, red cabbage, red onions. And fermented foods are also very good for the gut. You're going to populate your microbiome. Gut microbiome diversity is very much associated with longevity and cognitive functioning as well. So it's one of the most important things. Then there's these uh, sulforaphane rich leafy green vegetables that have a ton of antioxidants. You're going to live longer. You're going to produce a better microbiome. Then there's these Ayurvedic herbs, turmeric, ginger, cinnamon, ginseng and black pepper as well. It's going to make it more bioavailable. Then there's dark pigment berries, you know, blueberries, strawberries, all those good stuff. Uh, different medicinal mushrooms, reishi, chaga is amazing, ashwagandha, you know, maca, all those good. You can find them in all, all, for all the food stores. Uh, yeah, all, more, all more, more, more of these mushrooms, you can find them actually growing in your local environment. So definitely take advantage of it. And, you know, chocolate, dark chocolate is one of the most, one of the most uh, richest sources of antioxidants and one of the best sources of magnesium in the world. And fat-soluble vitamins from fish and uh, organ meats, carrots, you know, blueberries, those are all one of the best superfoods in the world. And also like these short-chain fatty acids that are the byproducts of, of metabolizing fermented foods and also stuff like butter as well. They're going to heal the gut lining, especially like this butyric acid from butter especially and uh, sauerkraut and stuff like that. They're one of the best, one of the most important things that feed your good microbiome. And one word on antioxidants, you don't want to be taking too many antioxidants because it's, it's sort of like it blunts the effect of your body to ability to resist the stress. If you take too many antioxidants, then your, your body isn't able to adapt to the stress. You actually become weaker. So some oxidative stress is good. You need the oxidative stress when you're lifting weights to actually get stronger. You need the oxidative stress from heat saunas, from cold thermogenesis. So there is a fine line of the hormetic response. 
So I generally don't recommend taking antioxidant supplements as long as you're eating a healthy diet with, you know, vegetables and blueberries and stuff like that. So yeah, different types of fasting, carbohydrate restriction, exercise, cold thermogenesis, they're all ways of making you more anti-fragile overall and uh, becoming, you know, increasing your entire well-being. And some, some foods that you definitely want to avoid are, you know, trans fats, the bad stuff, processed carbohydrates, artificial sweeteners, high fructose corn syrup, and all those good. And of course, whenever you do eat some gluten, then you don't have to be afraid that you're going to fall into a coma afterwards. <laughs> so the blueprint, you can see it over here, you know, the eat a keto diet most of the time, use these different carbo strategies, hormetic fruits, antifragile, antifragile strategies, and uh, I'm going to finish my presentation with a quote by Nassim Nicholas Taleb, which is, the three most harmful addictions are heroin, carbohydrates, and a monthly salary. So they're all things that are keeping you in a fragile state, and we want to kind of transcend them and become better in the sense. So thank you for listening.